Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week, we have a radiation special focusing on the truth about Fukushima. It features encore presentations of two important interviews from the past year. In the first, from Nuclear Hot Seat number 161, Dr. Alex Rosen of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War takes on the United Nations UNSCEAR report on Fukushima radiation dangers. Then Joseph Mangano of Radiation and Public Health Project provides his response to UNSCEAR and the impact that report is likely to have on the case of the USS Reagan sailors. That interview is from Nuclear Hot Seat number 161. In April, when the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, or UNSCEAR, published a report that seriously, if not criminally, understated the health dangers of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, I knew the interview I wanted to get. Alex Rosen is a German pediatrician who is vice president of the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War in Germany. He's also a former vice chair of the International IPPNW Board of Directors. He uses that organization's recently published critical analysis of the UNSCEAR report to decode its methodology and, in effect, demolish its credibility. Alex Rosen, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Hello. Greetings from Berlin. What is the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, or IPPNW, and what is your position in regard to it? IPPNW is an international NGO founded in 1980 by a Soviet and an American cardiologist who had the crazy notion to not just save their patients, but the whole world by making everyone understand the true dangers behind nuclear weapons. They managed to get the leaders of their two countries down to negotiate arms reduction and received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985. IPPNW has been around since the 1980s and has expanded its mission not just to work against nuclear weapons, but also against all parts of the nuclear chain. That is the uranium mining, the civil use of nuclear energy, the military use um, of nuclear weapons, all the way to the problem of nuclear waste. My position in IPPNW is that I am currently the vice chair of the German affiliates. We have more than 60 affiliates around the world, and the German one, which has its head office here in Berlin, has about 7,000 members, and we have a board that I am a member of. What is the IPPNW's previous relationship or stance as regards UNSCEAR? UNSCARE, the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, has been widely criticized, not just by IPPNW, but by doctors and scientists around the world for its stance on uh, nuclear energy, especially regarding the um, accident or the catastrophe in, in Chernobyl. And this is the history or the story that we see repeating itself now again in Fukushima, that UNSCARE is issuing statements and, and press releases that we feel are not very representative of what is really going on on the ground. So IPPNW Germany has been criticizing UNSCARE ever since Chernobyl for its stance on promoting uh, or whitewashing nuclear catastrophes. And right now we are working together with more than a dozen other IPPNW affiliates around the world, including the U.S. affiliate, on actually making known and making making public what UNSCARE is, is saying and uh, where their report about the Fukushima disaster is wrong. IPPNW has issued a critique, an annotated critique, of the UNSCEAR report on Fukushima. Before we get into the specifics of it, how was this put together? Well, we are an international organization, so we have people all over the world working on this topic. And mainly the U.S. and the German affiliate have been uh, working on, on this topic of the UNSCARE report, meeting regularly on Skype calls, um, sending each other documents, exchanging views, and getting expertise from all over the world, from India, from the U.K., from Australia, from Austria and Switzerland, from some of our African affiliates, like in Nigeria, 
scientists and doctors all across the world bringing together their expertise on the health effects of ionizing radiation in order to really take a critical look at UNSCARE's findings and make public what we feel is, is wrong or is missing. There are 10 specific conclusions that were reached by this critical analysis as regards the UNSCARE report. Let's go through them individually so you can explain to us the exact factors that led to the conclusions and the criticisms that you have about the report. The first is that the validity of UNSCARE's source term estimates is in doubt. Yes. Um, when we looked at UNSCARE's report, the most obvious question that we had, first of all, is which facts do they base their calculations of the health effects in Fukushima on? And one of the most important parameters when you look at um, radioactive contamination is, of course, how many radionuclides, how much radioactivity was released by the accident. And there are several calculations or estimations that are circulating internationally by different organizations. And they give different numbers on the size or the magnitude of radioactive emissions. And what UNSCARE does is it doesn't take the most neutral source. It doesn't take a median between the highest and the lowest estimation. It doesn't take a source that you could argue this would be the most, uh, most believable. They take the Japanese Atomic Energy Association scientist who's estimation on the amount of, of radioactive emissions is lower by a few factors than the estimations by neutral sources like the Norwegian Institute for Air Research or the Austrian Central Meteorologic Institute. So just to give one example, UNSCAR says that the emission of cesium-137, so that's a very particular radionuclide that's important to know when you talk about radioactive contamination, was 9 peta becquerel. And so that's nine quadrillion becquerel, uh, whereas the independent Norwegian Institute for Air Research, they found 37 peta becquerels, more than four times that number. And now we're not saying that the Norwegians are completely right and the Japanese Atomic Energy Association is completely wrong. All we're saying is if there's different numbers, you have to closely look at who is publishing these numbers, with which interest, how valid are their calculations, and does it really make sense to take the lowest possible numbers, which come from the Japanese Atomic Energy Association directly, an organization that is being heavily criticized by the Japanese parliament, in fact, for being co-responsible for the nuclear disaster in Fukushima. And if you take their numbers, their low estimates, then obviously your calculations that you do with these numbers will have a systematic underestimation of the health effects in the end. There are serious concerns regarding the calculations of internal radiation. Yes, that's the next issue that we are dealing with in our report or our critique of the UNSCARE report, the concerns regarding the calculations of internal radiation. So the next parameter after looking at the emissions, the magnitude of the emissions, is you want to see how much of this radioactivity was actually incorporated by people. And with incorporated, I mean inhaled in terms of radioactive dust floating in the atmosphere or ingested with food or Drink. So it's very important to look at the radioactive contamination of food and drink in, in Japan, especially in the affected uh, region in northeastern Honshu Island, and to look at how much of this radioactivity would actually be ingested by people or inhaled. And in order to do that, you need to have food samples, first of all. You need to go on the fields and in the markets and actually take samples in order to calculate or estimate how much radioactivity is in everyone's food. And you need to make assumptions on the amount of food people eat the origin of their food. And what UNSCARE does is, first of all, they base their entire calculations on internal radiation on one single source. And now this source could be an independent scientific uh, committee or an organization that has done independent testing. But instead, what UNSCARE does is they take as the single source of their calculation of internal radiation the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA. And we all know that the IAEA was founded in order to promote civil nuclear energy. So they don't have a very big interest in actually showing a lot of negative effects of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. In fact, you could say they're very biased and they're not the best source to base calculations of internal radiation on. 
But this is what Unscare does. They take the IAEA food database as the single source of their calculations, and um, nowhere in the document, in the Unscare report, does it say how these samples were taken, who took them, where they were taken, when they were taken. It just refers to a spreadsheet the food database, which never appears in the document and which is supposed to be published at a later point in a sort of addendum, but which still isn't available to researchers and independent uh, scientists like us wanting to see where this data actually comes from. So there's no way to check or to control how valid these food samples were. What we do know is that the IAEA database, of which certain parts have been published by the WHO, shows maximum levels of, of radioactive contamination, which are much lower than even the Japanese government's numbers. So we're very worried that by taking this database as the single source, you're actually underestimating the effects of internal radiation, and adding to that the assumptions that UNSCARE bases its calculations on, assumptions on the amount of food that people eat from the affected region, the amount of checks and, uh, and controls that are taking place in Fukushima, these assumptions are just, are just wrong. They're not based on reality, and they draw a picture that is much too optimistic in our view. Another issue that was raised by the critique of Unscare's report is that the dose assessments of the Fukushima workers cannot be relied upon. Yes, this is uh, another point where, again, we're talking about uh, which sources you base your calculations on. If you're looking at the group of Fukushima workers, um, you would think that you would take independent uh, research data on these people in order to calculate their health effects. But instead, UNSCARE bases its numbers solely on the numbers that it gets from TEPCO. Now, TEPCO is the company that ran Fukushima before it went bankrupt over the catastrophe. It's a company that owns several nuclear power plants in Japan that made millions, if not billions of dollars with nuclear energy, and which obviously does not have have an interest in making this catastrophe look worse than it is. And um, instead, what we see is that they don't just hire people themselves, but what they do oftentimes is they hire subcontractors. And these subcontractors hire other subcontractors. So in the end, the people actually doing the dirty work in and for TEPCO are people that are so far away from TEPCO's rules and regulations that it's very difficult to actually make sure that these people adhere to the safety standards that these people's exposition to radioactive contamination is actually properly measured. There have been reports of missing dosimeters there have been reports of uh, lead coverings on the dosimeters in order to manipulate the readings. There have been reports of mafia connections in the group of subcontractors. So there's a lot of shady deals and corruption going on on these levels. And taking the numbers of TEPCO as the sole source to calculate health effects of the workers without any independent data available, nothing from the government, nothing from independent researchers, just TEPCO's own data, again, leads to systematic underestimation of the health effects. Excuse me, I just have to pause for a moment because the it's one thing to say, you know, they're, that they're wrong about it. It's another to hear the specifics of exactly how they manipulated it. Another conclusion that was reached by the report is that the UNSCARE report ignores the effects of fallout on the non-human biota. Yes, what that means is that we're not just talking about humans, obviously, we're talking about plants, we're talking about animals. And what we've learned from Chernobyl is that, especially in the animal population, you are much better able to demonstrate health effects and transgenerational effects, not just on the animals that were alive and present at the time of the disaster, but their offspring generations down the line. And obviously with butterflies or mice, you have much better chances at researching these transgenerational effects than, than you do in a, in a human population where obviously people are not guinea pigs. So um, what scientists have been doing, and uh, there's a very active U.S. group around Tim Mosso, who's a, a scientist who's been traveling to Chernobyl for many years, catching birds and looking at, at different types of animals and their health effects in regards to, to radioactive contamination. And they've been able to find several very meaningful health effects concerning fertility, concerning mutations, and 
all of this knowledge is out there. It's, it's published in peer-reviewed journals. It's there, and you can research it on the Internet, but it doesn't appear in the UNSCA report. What the UNSCA report says is that there's no real data on the non-human biota, and therefore they do not take it into consideration. And this is something that we are criticizing, obviously, because you can't say because something happens to butterfly, it will also happen to humans. But at least, and this is what we know from pharmacological studies and other, other health studies, you can deduce something from it. And you can say, well, if this happens in all types of mammals, why shouldn't it happen in human beings? And especially the transgenerational effects, which are so difficult to demonstrate in, in a human population, can be demonstrated, can be seen, can be proven in animal populations. And that's at least food for thought. It's at least something that should be considered. Considered. And you, you should say, well, we see this effect in animals, we see this effect in plants, we expect a similar effect in human beings. How large it is, we don't know at this point, but at least it's ground enough for further research. But this is not happening, and this is our, our criticism. And what we're doing in, in our paper is basically listing some of the findings of Tim Oso and his group and asking Unscare to include it in, in, in future, future publications. The next issue that was raised by the critique was the special vulnerability of the embryo to radiation and that it was not taken into account. Yeah, this is an issue that's very important to me as a pediatrician. Human beings don't react to radioactivity the same way. Radioactivity has stochastic effects. That means that it's not about determining a certain dose or a certain amount of radioactivity that is harmful and everything below that is, is safe. It's not like that. It's actually similar to when you're talking about smoking. You can't say two cigarettes is fine and three cigarettes will kill you. It's all about chances that you take. And the more you smoke or the more contact you have to radioactive exposure, the higher your chances of actually getting a disease or getting cancer. And obviously this is, like in smoking, very dependent on your own genetic background, on your own immune system. So obviously someone who has a very good immune system, who is rather good at repairing cell defects from radiation or other toxins, will have a lower chance of actually catching cancer, for example, after being exposed to radiation. So there's people out there, for example, people with immune defects, people who take medication that reduces their immune functions, and children whose immune systems aren't fully developed yet, who have a much higher vulnerability towards radioactive effects. And this is not taken into consideration, especially the unborn child, which is the most vulnerable to radioactivity. We know that from research that goes back into the 1950s, an adult can very well take an X-ray of the chest without developing cancer afterwards. But we know that an unborn child in a, in a woman's womb is so vulnerable to radioactivity or to ionizing radiation that, in fact, even small amounts of radiation, like from a normal X-ray, can actually increase the chances of a child getting cancer by very substantial degrees. So one single x-ray to the abdomen of a pregnant woman would increase the chance of getting cancer within childhood by 50%. And this is just one x-ray, and we're talking about much higher doses in Fukushima. So by saying that all people are alike and all children are alike and there's no difference between an unborn child or a child of five years old, this radiobiologic knowledge that we've accumulated over several decades is just completely discounted in the UNSCA report, and they're acting like we wouldn't know that children, and especially unborn children, have a much higher vulnerability. So that's a point that, that I, especially as a pediatrician, feel very strongly about that needs to be corrected. It, it cannot be that we base all our recommendations regarding radiation dose levels on healthy adults, healthy male adults, instead of actually on the most vulnerable population, which is the unborn child. Here's one of the other points that really struck me in the list of objections that have been voiced by IPPNW against the UNSCEAR report, and that is non-cancer diseases and hereditary effects were ignored by UNSCEAR. Yes, that's another big problem. Even though we know for many years that radiation, ionizing radiation, causes not just cancer effects, but non-cancer effects as well, such as cardiovascular diseases, glaucoma, psychological and neurological effects, endocrinologic diseases, diseases of the thyroid, for example. We know all of this. 
also from the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also from um, the liquidators of Chernobyl, uh, the people that were sent in to, to clean up the mess after, after the explosion. And this knowledge is completely ignored by UNSCAR. They act as if there was no scientific evidence for it, even though there's numerous studies that show the significant effects of radiation on, for example, cardiovascular diseases or thyroid diseases in people who received low-dose radiation after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the same is true for transgenerational effects, genetic effects in future generations that we also see, for example, in, in the studies done on animals by Tim Mousseau that I mentioned earlier, but also on, on human populations where the effects, for example, on children of British nuclear workers lead to increased leukemia rates if their parents were exposed to, to radioactivity. So these are effects that you can't just argue away. Instead of arguing away, they're just being ignored by UNSCARE. UNSCARE also did, according to the analysis, misleading comparisons of nuclear fallout with background radiation. So this is what UNSCARE and other organizations are frequently doing. They're saying, hey, we're just talking about an additional radiation dose of one or two millisieverts per year per person. So this can't really be harmful because natural background radiation is already one or two millisieverts a year. And that's where they're wrong. Obviously, natural background radiation is something that you can't completely avoid. And there's regions in the world where it's higher and there's regions in the world where it's lower. But studies have repeatedly shown that in the regions where it's higher, it's actually causing more cancer. And in the regions where it's lower, people have less cancer. And people who are exposed to more radon gas in, in their homes because they live in an environment that is very rich in radioactive substances in the ground have higher cancer rates. And people who fly a lot, transatlantic flights, and have increased cosmic radiation, they get more cancers. And people who are exposed to higher degrees of terrestrial radiation, they also have a higher cancer rate. Because the correlation between cancer and, or the chance of, of getting cancer and radiation dose is linear. Linear without a threshold. So it goes down to zero. Even small radiation doses lead to a, a measurable rise in the chance to develop cancer. And there is no threshold under which you can say everything is safe. And this is the, the story that they're trying to, to sell to people. If it's just one or two millisieverts per year that you're exposed to because of Fukushima fallout, then you don't have anything to worry about. But that's not true. That's like saying to someone, listen, you're just smoking one cigarette a day. That's something that everyone smokes, so you shouldn't worry about it. But people who want to live healthy lives, people who don't want to be exposed to radiation, people who don't want an increased cancer rate, they should have the right to live in an environment that is healthy and that is free of radioactive contamination from, from nuclear fallout. This is something that's man-made. It, it's preventable. And in the regions where it's not preventable anymore because fallout happened, you should give options to the people to move to other places. But this is not happening. This next conclusion, number eight, is, I think, masterful understatement, and that is that the IPPNW says that UNSCEAR's interpretations of the findings are questionable. Yes, what we mean by that is it's not just that they base their calculations on the data and the assumptions, and it's not just the way that they calculate it, but in the end, they draw conclusions, and these conclusions, you could say, okay, now we can calculate how many deaths or how many cancer cases are to be expected. But UNSCAR doesn't do that. They don't seriously discuss their findings. So, I mean, we're walking a tight line here. On the one hand, we're criticizing UNSCAR for systematically underestimating the health effects. On the other hand, we are asking them to at least use the findings that they have and interpret them in a way for people to understand them. It's not very useful to tell people this is the collective dose that the population will be exposed to because people can't really do anything with that number. But if you take this number and you... You actually use the risk factors that, that are publicly available and you calculate what health effects, what number of cancer cases or cancer deaths this leads to, then you can tell people what they actually can expect. And at the same time, we have to say that these expectations or these, these estimations are probably still an underestimation due to the, the factors that we mentioned earlier. 
Another criticism brought forward is that the protective measures taken by the authorities are misrepresented. Yes, Ansgar mentions in its report that radiation exposure to the population would have been much higher if the government hadn't protected the population so well. And while this is obviously true, population could have been exposed to more radiation in, in Japan. We feel that it's wrong to cheer the Japanese government for its wonderful uh, cleanup efforts or its wonderful preventive efforts because actually what happened in Fukushima, and this is not our opinion, this was, was written by the Japanese Parliament's investigation committee, it was a complete breakdown of the measures that should actually have protected the population. There was complete and utter chaos. People did not know what they were doing. There were no plans in the drawer. The prime minister was completely taken by surprise. He didn't know that Japan had, for example, a radiation tracking system in place that could have let people know where radiation was actually traveling to. Instead, people were evacuated from areas of low radiation to areas of high radiation because no one in the upper echelons knew that this the system existed. We all know that stable iodine tablets can prevent radioactive iodine from a nuclear catastrophe from traveling to the thyroid and causing thyroid cancer. But in Japan, these stable iodine tablets were not distributed to the population in order to prevent a mass panic. So there were a lot of issues concerning the immediate uh, response to the catastrophe, concerning the evacuations, the extent of the evacuations, the cleanup efforts, where it's not very useful to actually say that uh, everything went perfectly and otherwise the catastrophe wouldn't, would have been much bigger. We feel that it's just fitting at this point to join the Japanese Parliament's Investigation Commission in their criticism of, of how badly actually the first response was and what could have been done better. Because, I mean, we're dealing with a problem that could happen any day again in Japan with more than 50 nuclear sites and an earthquake-prone region. So this is not something that happened once and will never happen again. We know from Chernobyl, we know from Fukushima, from Harrisburg, that it could happen any time and in every country. So in order to improve the safety plans and the public safety for the population, it's not very useful to just say this time everything went well because it didn't. And obviously it could have been much worse. Yes, Japan was very lucky, so to speak. The people of Japan were very lucky that the wind was blowing eastwards and blew more than 80% of the radiation out to the sea. If the wind had blown south, even just for one day, the metropolis of Tokyo would have been subjected to radioactive fallout. And this is something that we don't want to imagine what that would have caused. But in effect, there was just one day of wind going northwest, which now is causing most of the problems that we're seeing in the, in the heavily affected um, cities and communities. Just from one day of radioactive fallout, all the other days, the Japanese were lucky enough that the wind blew east. So, yes, it's some way you can say that... Um, this catastrophe could have been much, much worse. The last point made is that conclusions from collective dose estimates were not represented. Yeah. Um, like I said before, the UNSCARE report mentioned the collective dose estimates, so it said how many person sieverts uh, the Japanese population will be exposed to in the coming decades, but they failed to actually say what this would mean for the people. To give an example, we tried to add this estimation. Just to give an example of how we did that, Unscare says that there will be a total collective dose of 48,000 person sieverts. So the total collective dose is the sum of all the individual doses of every person in Japan that is exposed to radioactivity due to Fukushima over their lifetime. This is the total collective dose, so 48,000 person sieverts. And if you take the risk factors that are internationally accepted, then this would lead to between four and 16,000 excess cases of cancer in Japan. Again, based on the underestimations that I just explained. So the number would probably be much higher if you actually took the right data and the right assumptions. But this is, if you just take the numbers that UNSCARE represents and calculates, you are dealing with four to 16,000 additional cases of cancer and two to 9,000 of these fatal. So you have 16,000 people who would develop cancer due to Fukushima who would otherwise not have developed cancer. 
You have a lot of them who survive after chemotherapy, operations, or radiation therapy, but you have 9,000 or a little more than 9,000 people who will die because of cancers related to the Fukushima nuclear accident. And this is something you have to tell the people. This is something that you have to admit and say, listen, this was a huge catastrophe, and this is what this will lead to. And what we can do is try to reduce this number by really having strict controls of radioactive contamination in the food, moving people, especially young families and children, away from the radioactively contaminated regions, giving them all the support that we can in order to get them out of the contaminated areas and to give them health care and health checks as would be appropriate in order to localize cancers and other diseases early and in order to treat them better. But only very little is happening in this regard. People are actually encouraged to move back to the radioactively contaminated regions because of economic factors. They don't want uh, these regions to become empty. They want to forget this ever happened. They want people to move on, and they don't want to admit that this will have health effects in the coming decades. They don't want to uh, admit that people will be suffering from it. And with they, I mean the Japanese nuclear village, the politicians behind nuclear energy, the companies behind nuclear energy, the state control organizations which are receiving money from the nuclear industry, all of them are trying to whitewash this, this catastrophe, and UNSCARE is part of this movement. UNSCARE is, is helping them, and this is something that we cannot accept as, as scientists and as doctors, that a UN body is actually whitewashing this catastrophe. This is a damning analysis of UNSCARE and their report. In your estimation, is... Unskir operating out of a difference of opinion and alternative interpretation of the data that they are using, or is there an element of outright lying and propaganda on the part of Unskir to protect the nuclear industry? I think that's a very difficult issue to tackle. You have to see that UNSCAR is a UN body, and as a UN body, the states that are members of the UN are sending delegates or are sending representatives to this body. So the question is, which states are sending representatives? It's the nuclear states. It's the United States, it's Canada, it's Germany, it's Japan, it's uh, India. It's the countries that have nuclear power, that have the capacity to have nuclear programs. And obviously these countries have a vested interest in keeping this nuclear power, this nuclear capacity. So they're sending scientists which are coming straight out of their nuclear programs, scientists that have grown up in these nuclear programs, that have made a career in the International Atomic Energy Agency, that have been working for nuclear fuel companies. So these are not people that you would say are critical of nuclear energy. No scientist that has ever published a critical paper on nuclear energy or health effects of ionizing radiation will ever be allowed in UNSCARE. UNSCARE is a club of scientists representing the interests of the nuclear states. And this is something that people have to be aware of. It's not an independent body of research. It's not a body that is composed of critical scientists on the one hand and pro-nuclear scientists on the other hand. It's strictly pro-nuclear, and there's people sitting, sitting on UNSCARE, and there's the scientists that are being quoted in their paper who have been working their entire lives for the nuclear industry in their countries. So I wouldn't go so far to say that they are lying there, doing propaganda, but they have a group thing. They're coming from organizations that are very pro-nuclear. They've never heard anything different. They have a certain bias that they just can't get away from. And what's necessary in science, in true science, is that you have different opinions and scientists from different fields arguing with each other and actually testing their hypothesis and testing their opinions against each other so that in the end what comes out is as close to the truth as possible. But UNSCARE is not the right body to do that. UNSCARE does not allow criticism, does not allow a neutral position. And so while I wouldn't say that UNSCARE deliberately lies or uses propaganda, I have to say that its views and its papers show very clearly who's paying the bill and very clearly where these people are coming from. How has the IPPNW critical analysis been received, meaning by the media? Has there been any kind of governmental response to it? And has it been acknowledged and responded to by UNSCARE? 
That's a very interesting question. We were in contact with Unscare before publishing our paper, and we actually, Unscare published a sort of executive summary, a sort of teaser or a, a preview on their full report at the UN General Assembly last October. And when we read this preview, we immediately responded to Unscare and told them, well, listen, reading through your, your paper, your executive summary, these are the points, these are the issues that we have problems with, these are the points that we see critically, and do you want to have a dialogue with us? What they did was they actually took a lot of our arguments, and we find now in the final paper, in the final version, some of our wording, some of our arguments, but the conclusions, they stay the same. So... In our first uh, first letter to Unscare, we criticized them for sitting in their ivory tower and passing judgment on people far away in other countries without actually looking at their individual suffering and their individual situations and just saying, don't worry, everything will be fine. But they don't travel to Fukushima and talk to the people up there and, and ask them how they are feeling. And so in their final paper, what they say is the same conclusion, everything will be fine, but they add the sentence that obviously it's very important to uh, realize that people are suffering and to uh, pay close attention to the individual stories of the people on the ground. So we see that in a way they've responded and taken up some of our criticism, but nothing has changed regarding their conclusions. And this is something that we don't expect any case. I mean, we don't expect to make a big dent on this organization of Unscare because obviously they come from backgrounds that don't allow for critical thinking or for critical points regarding nuclear energy. <laughs> That's not how they make their money. That's not why they are sitting in this, in this position and being flown across the world in this UN body. It's because they are saying what the governments want them to say. Regarding the reception that our paper got by the media, there were two large press conferences, one in New York City in front of the UN together with the Human Rights Now and one in Berlin. Both were pretty well um, visited. We had some TV appearances. We had some newspaper articles and radio articles or radio stories regarding our findings. Overall, it's a very scientific and very specific topic and doesn't really go down well in, in mainstream media. Media. But that wasn't our intention. I think our intention was that this UNSCA report will be cited and will be referred to for years to come. People will always say, well, in the UNSCA reports it says this and that. And our point was just that we want to give people an alternative view. We want to say, well, it might say so in the UNSCA report, but read our criticism and then question if what it says in the UNSCA report is really the truth. We don't think that we have the truth in our hands either. We are much too small and much too limited in our resources to be able to do giant research on hundreds and thousands of people in Japan in order to find out what's, what's actually happening with them. But what we can do as scientists and as, as doctors and as human beings is to ask critical questions and to ask, is this really believable? Is this really the truth? And I think the journalists that caught this line, who saw that as we are just doctors, trying to protect our patients, trying to stand up to an industrial lobby which is causing harm to public health, promoting a world that is healthy and free of nuclear contamination. I think these journalists, they got it right and they were able to spread our message. And we hope that in the coming years and decades, when people look at the UNSCARE report, they will also find our report and have maybe a more critical or unbiased view of UNSCARE's findings. What can we do to help bring this important analysis to international attention? Well, what we're trying to do now is to actually get this criticism to the different UN delegations, which will be reviewing UNSCARE's report at the upcoming General Assembly meeting in October. What every individual blogger, journalist, everyone who's in the topic can do is actually spread this, uh, this information and say, well, here's the UNSCARE report. You can read it and you can find a lot of information in it. And here's a critical analysis of the UNSCARE report, which you can use in addition in order to better understand where the limitations and problems of the UNSCA report actually lie. If someone is able to make this information more widely known, for example, through news outlets like your own show or uh, through blogs or Wikipedia articles, I think it's just important for this information to reach people. 
This might be a student doing research for his, his class project. This might be a teacher doing research for what he's going to teach his students. This might be politicians or their aides looking for information in order to shape policies. This might be journalists doing uh, background research or just the general public, people who have a nuclear power plant in their uh, close proximity and want to find out what happened in Fukushima. All of these people would profit from an unbiased, from a scientific approach to the unscare report that is not dainted by industrial interests, the interests of a lobby group, a very powerful lobby group, annotated by, by doctors and scientists with the aim of actually getting a clearer picture of the health effects of ionizing radiation as a result of Fukushima fallout. That was Alex Rosen calling in from Berlin. He is a German pediatrician. Vice President of International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War in Germany, and former Vice Chair of the International IPPNW Board of Directors. The critical analysis of the UNSCIR report that he cited was created by the IPPNW and is available in English, German, and Japanese translations. All will be linked on the website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog, under this episode, number 184. A reminder that Nuclear Hot Seat needs your donations to keep growing, and right now I'm raising money to be able to attend Dr. Helen Caldicott's symposium on the dynamics of possible nuclear extinction. I plan to bring back interviews, activist perspective, and give you a sense of being up close and personal with the event itself. That will take place the end of February and beginning of March, so if you wish to make a contribution specifically to cover my travel expenses, Go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the home page, and click on the big red Donate button. Thanks to those who have already contributed. I am over one-third of the way to meeting my budget requirements for this, and I truly appreciate all your support. In Nuclear Hot Seat number 162, I spoke with Joseph Mangano, an epidemiologist and executive director of Radiation and Public Health Project to get his perspective on the manipulation of radiation data from Fukushima as it impacts the case of the sailors from the USS Ronald Reagan, who, while on an humanitarian aid mission, ended up sailing directly into the radiation plume from the destroyed nuclear reactors with devastating impact on their health. As an epidemiologist, give us a sense as to how well or how poorly this comparison was set up. First of all, there are 112 sailors, one of whom has since died, who are part of the lawsuit against TEPCO because of their severe illnesses. At the time of Operation Tomodachi, there were 4,843 sailors on the Reagan, and the control group, meaning the members of the Operation Tomodachi registry, which did not contain any of the sailors, from the Reagan, numbered 65,269. That was what was compared with the just under 5,000 sailors on the Reagan. What's right or wrong about this means of comparison? Well, it's a little odd because usually in a comparison like this, it's one-to-one. In other words, they would compare 4,800 sailors on the Reagan versus 4,800 other sailors, or sometimes one-to-two or maybe a little more. This is like 1 to 16, which which is a bit of overkill. Still, uh, even with that, we would expect the report to find something unusual. Not speaking scientifically, but just uh, in plain English. We're talking about 4,800 some odd sailors. These are mostly people in their 20s and 30s. They're very physically fit. You know, they, they certainly all were qualified for military service. And the idea that in three years, 112 of them are sick with a variety of illnesses just does not jive with any sort of scientific understanding of such an otherwise healthy group. Yes, certainly young people get sick, but but not this, this number. And there are actually, when I say 112, these are the 112 sailors who have actually filed suit. Both the attorneys for the, the sick sailors and even in the Defense Department reports say there are more. Attorneys say it's maybe around 500 or more, and the Defense Department report even suggests that 
around a thousand are sick with one illness or another. R- right then and there, common sense says that there's something wrong here in, in such a short period of time with such young, healthy people that, that so many are, are suffering from illnesses. Even though the method used wasn't exactly wrong, certainly the conclusion should raise a lot of eyebrows that, the, that radiation didn't harm these people. We've learned that in the Operation Tomodachi Registry, not one of the sailors who are part of the lawsuit, who are the ones we're in contact with, was asked to fill out any kind of paperwork or be part of the registry. How appropriate is that in terms of coming up with an overall compilation of the impact of the radiation on this group of people? Well, hopefully the... Defense Department had uh, medical records of these sailors at their disposal. I mean, yes, if you wanted to do a a very good study, you would contact all of them and get a thorough health history and history of what happened when they sailed towards Fukushima and and what happened afterwards. That is the best. And if you're going to do, you know, for something such serious as this, that's what should have been done. But otherwise, they should have had access to health records, to medical records for all these people. And I don't know if that was the case or not. They're saying that the doses of radiation that were received by the sailors were, quote, very small and well below levels associated with adverse medical conditions. How accurate is that for you? Well, that, that I think, is the big one here. Doses are too low. First of all, that is a falsehood. Every dose of radiation harms people, no matter how low, no matter how high. This is not my opinion. It is the conclusion based on hundreds and hundreds of scientific studies of eminent researchers that have found that even low doses cause harm, especially in in vulnerable groups such as infants and elderly people. Secondly, that statement usually is a result of (laughs) taking the doses from other types of radiation. There's different types of radiation, usually x-rays, and extrapolating them, you know, translating them down to the amounts they received while at sea. The radiation that came out of Fukushima that these sailors were exposed to is a special kind. Not that any radiation is good. No, it's all harmful. But these radioactive chemicals and... Nuclear reactors produce more than 100 of them. They're not found in nature. They are especially harmful. They're the same bunch of 100 or more chemicals that are released when an atomic bomb explodes, okay? They didn't occur. They they didn't didn't exist in nature before 1945. The first time we, we found them was when... The bombs were exploded in Japan in World War II at at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And they have a different journey, a different (laughs) route uh, into the body than, say, x-rays. X-rays, you you take a picture of someone, and this ray just zings right through your body. Yes, it does harm people, but it goes right through. The radiation that the sailors absorbed were breathed and even drank and eaten in water and food that had become contaminated. And these chemicals go right into your body. It's called an internal exposure, whereas an X-ray is more of an external exposure. We're talking apples and oranges here. You can't compare the two. So the whole Defense Department reports, which was based on other types of radiation, really is not backed up by science. What's the biggest misconception people have when they hear the term low-level radiation? Well, throughout the atomic era, and I'm talking about the last 70 years, there was an assumption that low doses didn't harm you. Okay, yes, we understand that being near the atomic bomb harmed people. It was just this assumption that relatively low doses wouldn't do anything for you. And certainly government leaders hung on to this assumption, but they were found to be wrong numerous times, and I'll give three examples. One was... Years ago, the doctors used to give pregnant women x-rays to the abdomen just to diagnose, to see how big the child was and where the child's head was. A study came out in 1956 showing it 
double the chance the child would die of cancer by age 10. The leaders went wild. No, it can't be. It's impossible. Several other studies were done. They found the same thing, and no more x-rays are done to the abdomen of pregnant women. Number two was the atomic bomb test fall. Years ago in the 50s and 60s, the atomic bombs were tested above the ground in Nevada. Although people were very upset about it and President Kennedy banned these above-ground tests, the government continued to maintain that the fallout, which went all the way across the country, didn't harm anybody. Finally, in 1999, a National Academy of Sciences study estimated that up to 212,000 Americans developed just thyroid cancer alone from these tests. The third one I'll give you is workers, you know, workers in nuclear plants that made weapons. For years, the government said, yes, we're monitoring their doses, and these doses are low, and they are not at any harm for any disease. Finally, in the year 2000, the Energy Department, the United States Energy Department put out a report listing several dozen studies that concluded that workers were at extra risk for a number of cancers, and that led the Congress to pass a, a bill compensating workers that happened to get sick. So, again, we have this pattern of low dose, let's assume it's harmless, let's deny but later on, oops, you know what, we've done studies and we found that this is incorrect. The same thing is going to happen with the sailors on the USS Reagan, I'm sure. Joe, what is important for people to understand when they hear about this report and see the numbers? The important things to remember, first of all, we're not talking about a small leak here. We're talking about the Fukushima meltdown. It was a catastrophic, massive meltdown, all right, along with Chernobyl the two worst nuclear disasters in history. So these were not small doses, as, as they put it. Number two, the fact that these, you know, very physically fit people have come down with, a lot of them have come down with illnesses, should be quite disturbing. An illness within three years in your 20s and 30s, when you're very healthy, and many of them are, are cancers and other immune disorders, is a very rare thing. Yeah, it happens on, on great occasions, but very rarely. Here we have 112 that went through with a lawsuit and probably hundreds of others that did not. So right there, there should be a disturbance. And, and for the Defense Department to just say, no, it isn't the radiation. Well, did they propose any other possible reasons? And did they look at any other potential factors? I don't believe they did. And I think there should be an independent review of the study and independent studies by someone other than essentially the employer of these sailors. That was epidemiologist Joseph Mangano, executive director of Radiation and Public Health Project. Here's today's final thought. As I've said before on this program, radiation is the battleground. In terms of public understanding of why nuclear technology of all sorts is so terrible, it all boils down to understanding what radiation is, what it does to our bodies, and to life on Earth. If its impact is not understood, it's easy for pro-nukers to trick people into thinking of nuclear as a good energy source that is, as their propaganda goes, clean, green, carbon-free, and sustainable all of which is a lie. How are they getting away with it? First of all, the damn stuff cooperates with them because radiation is invisible. You can't see, smell, taste, touch, or feel it in any way. Out of sight, out of mind. That's what the nuclear industry counts on, and it is a tough one for us to overcome. Pro-nuclear forces also do their best to confuse our understanding of dosage. They mix up the issues of ionizing, meaning nuclear radiation, with non-ionizing radiation, such as that which comes from the sun, air travel, or even bananas. Ionizing, bad. Non-ionizing, eh, maybe some problems, but they don't include genetic mutation and the likelihood of cancer. But when we who oppose nuclear try to bring up these differences, we are smacked over the head with words languaging. Our position is called emotional. 
we are labeled fear mongers or scare mongers. And the ultimate put down, we're ill-informed because we're not scientists and we're not doctors. So how could we possibly understand what they understand? And that's not the only way languaging is used to keep us from considering the impact of radiation. If there's a leak, it's always called low-level radiation, as though it's no big deal. Or they say that there is no significant danger. All of it language that says, in essence, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain who is glowing with nuclear radiation. They will talk about radiation in a confusing array of different measurements, becquerels, sieverts, millirems, rads, all of it obfuscating the size of the dose and its impact upon life. They take advantage of the time lapse between exposure to radiation and the occurrence of disease to deny, deny, deny that there is any possibility of a connection. So when cancer shows up in one exposed to radiation at Fukushima, they either say it happened so quickly it couldn't possibly be from radiation exposure or it's been so long you can't prove the connection. Another way they lie is that nuclear proponents do not differentiate between external and internal radiation exposure, treating them as though they are both the same. But there's a big difference. External radiation exposure is like warming your hands over a roaring bonfire. Internal radiation exposure is like swallowing a hot coal. Bit of a difference there. Now, all radiation exposure is bad, but at least if it's external, it can be scrubbed off, silk-wooded off, protected against, clothes can be disposed of, masks can be used to block its internalization. But once that radioactive substance gets inside of you, it is up close and personal with your internal organs with no way to block its ongoing impact on your health. If you inhale one millionth of a gram of plutonium, you will get lung cancer, whether you ever smoked cigarettes in your life or not. Yet, the nuclear industry lumps these concepts, internal and external exposure, together and use that concept to minimize the risks. That's how the Environmental Protection Agency and executives of Waste Control Specialists, which runs the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site in Carlsbad, New Mexico, gets away with having 22 workers confirmed to have been internally contaminated after the Valentine's Day 2014 explosion and subsequent leak of plutonium and americium. They say, low-level radiation, and everyone thinks, eh, no big deal. Not even the union is following up on behalf of the 22 workers who have been exposed to confirmed internal dosages. People are lulled into believing there's no problem. Go about your business. Pay no attention to the cancer clock that's now ticking down to illness and death in those 22 men. And the misinformation and disinformation keeps growing as propaganda campaigns expand in Japan, the United States, and elsewhere. I'll admit it took me some time to wrap my head around radiation, and I still have a long way to go to understand it thoroughly. But this I do know. If people don't understand the nature of the risk they are exposed to from nuclear radiation, they won't have a basis for understanding why it's necessary to oppose this technology in all of its forms, as well as why it's necessary to take steps to protect one's health as best they can. We as a movement need to find simple ways to explain radiation so that even a child could understand it. We need to get those explanations, those simple explanations, out into the world. That's what pro-nuclear forces are doing from the other direction to try and dismiss any concerns. In 2015 and beyond, we as a movement need to be taking this kind of information from our perspective and putting it out into the world with diligence, regularity, and a greatly increased frequency. After all, it's only the future of everyone and everything that's at stake. No pressure. This has been a special Encore presentation of Nuclear Hot Seat. I'm Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart 
of the Art of Communicating, reminding you that life is good. Go out and share it with someone you care about. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.